So, Design Master kites, or Design Master spray paint, or color tool, or professional tool is what they call it. Um, I first came across it in um, 92 winter um, kiting, kite lines, kite lines. Um, Chris Dunlop had done an article, and I, I looked at it, saw oh, that looks nice. I didn't pay much attention to that. Went to uh, Washington Festival, Wiskiff, saw Don Mock was using some paint on there. And it's like, oh, this is interesting. He was doing a fade technique. Uh, saw some work by another gentleman, Spencer Chung from Hawaii, was doing a fade technique and also doing splatter paint. So that was uh, cool. And, and, and so I decided, you know, I'll give this a try. I went and saw Ron Gibeon, um, showed him my sketchbooks, and he says, you got to start building this stuff. You know, you need to get this out there. And so that kind of got me started after seeing him experimenting. So a lot of the stuff that I'll show here today was done in a couple of weeks as far as experimenting. What worked for me, what didn't work, and then I finally settled down to just a fade or a tr gradient or transition colors is what I settled on that I liked up in the sky. The rest of the stuff was interesting, but the effect didn't work for what I wanted. Um, so what is Design Master? It's a modified lacquer. It's not an acrylic, which is like a water base or an enamels. So it's a, a little different. Um, it, I'm going to always refer to my notes here. Modified lacquer. What's interesting about this is that it, it uh, reactivates the old paint. So you put a layer of paint down, you put another layer on it, and it bonds instead of just sitting on top of it. So that's what's unique. There's a disadvantage to that in that if you have on a paint board and you're spraying, it activates the paint behind it also if it's too thick. And I'll show some examples of that. So there's a disadvantage of it reactivating and bonding to the paint. Um, what else do we want to say on this? Yeah, comes in about 40, 50 colors. You have your brochures. You can see through all that. Prices, I pay five and a quarter a can from a wholesaler. Um, a floral spray wholesaler. And otherwise, you're paying nine bucks at Michael's or whatever for that. But you get the coupons, you can get it less than that. One big can, one of these cans will do uh, a 20 foot banner that has lots of, of mango, lots of yellow color on it that I use red uh, for that. One of these will do a banner easily. I paint both sides of everything I do. There's some examples in here that are not painted both sides, but generally I paint both sides just to get the, the nice color and saturation on it. Uh, let's talk about the do, well, let's just talk about safety. So the old cans used to say, and I've got it here, do not breathe the vapor, the gas, the mist, or the spray. That was the old cans. Now it just says, vapor's harmful. <laughs> hmm. And it used to contain, if I can get all these out, Acetone, isobutyl acetate, isopropanol, butyl exethanol, who knows what, propane, and now it just has two of those things listed on there. It's like, hmm, did they change their formula? Probably not. Not good stuff to breathe, okay? Um, although when you go on their um, website and you see them doing videos, she's in there, Gretchen's in there just painting flower pots like crazy in a, in a room, you don't hear any fans going or anything. She's just painting away, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, good for you. But um, It's like um, graffiti artists. You'll see a lot of graffiti artists that do wear masks and a lot of them that don't. So why take a chance? Respirator. So I wear a respirator. Uh, this is Kat. She just brought it in. We just opened it up. These twist on and off. I'm not going to take the time to do that. You have a pre-filter that can be replaced easily. The cartridges will last about six months is all. So they're carbon, they absorb moisture, they absorb everything around. So when we opened up her bag, it's like, oh look, they give you a nice little bag to seal them in. When you're finished painting, you just put the mask in there. And uh, so I have something similar at home that I use. But the cartridges, 
depending on how much you use it, about six months. So you're just gonna put your pre-filter in there and you'll be able to tell when it's dirty because it gets dark. We'll click that one on there. So these are some used pre-filters and I've cut them open so that you can see inside and it's gone through several layers. So this is, that could be your lungs. Okay, that's what I'm just saying. This is the mist that you're breathing. Okay, so it's just a, a good idea. And it hasn't gone all the way through because the next layer is still clean, but if it gets all the way through, hmm, better change it. So anyways, I changed those. That's about typical when it gets that dark. So this one's pretty new still. You can see the difference there, really new. And mine usually when it's purple, because I use a lot of red and blue paint, then I know I've, it's probably done. So that's that with those. Let's see, what else do we want to talk about on respirators? They come in a couple of sizes, um, large and medium, easy to adjust. Nothing else on that. Mm. Respirators, I, Home Depot. It's like 30 bucks. Uh, hardware stores, yeah, any of those stores. Um, they, yeah, avoid, don't use just the dusk masks because they're not filtering the, the vapor out. Um, let's see what else I want to do here. All right, where do I spray? Um, I recommend outside, except today when it's windy. Um, one of the problems with outside, of course, is, is insects and wind and, and rain, all those kinds of things. So I spray inside my garage. I have a fan at one, in, well, right below my uh, paint booth area. I have the garage door open so it sucks the air out. Um, in the winter time, I have to have a heater in there. Oh, warning about the paint. Don't paint next to your hot water heater, okay, the, the vapors. Okay, so don't paint inside your garage if you have a water, any kind of ignition source, right? Ignition source, stay away from that with those. Propane is in there. Um, what else? So I have a four foot by eight foot, um, like a particle board that's below the window where the fan is, and that's the area that I spray paint on. The board is vertical, and I tape the fabric on there. So we're gonna do that outside in a little while. I'll show you how that's done, but I spray things vertically. Um, let's see, what else do we wanna talk about the area? Overspray, you do get overspray. My shoes turn reddish purple, because I wear the same ones, and I spray a lot out there, and I can look. And then my right one, more so than the left. Why would that be? Ah, so, ah, that's like, I look and it's like, oh yeah, red shoes. Um, if you get it on your hands, it washes off. Not a big deal. You kind of have to scrub it off. It bonds really well. Go ahead. Um, I haven't used alcohol. It's... I use a scrub brush. It's like, oh, gone. Soap. Oh, soap. <laughs> Boys that use soap, right? Look at that. Um, what else do we want to get going on this? Let's see in there. Yeah, I've got some of that. I'll show you those. I'm just getting through some other stuff here. Okay. So, oh, handles while well, he's mentioning the handles. So, we have these. Uh, my finger does get tired when I'm doing the large banners. It's like squeezing. Uh, lots, lots. So, they have these. They used to be like at the dollar store, and now, oh, it's five bucks for one, and it just snaps on. Pull the trigger, same thing, okay? Um, welcome to use those. Gloves, I don't use very often, unless I'm holding a template really close, and then I get paint on my hand, but otherwise I don't use the gloves very often. Um, talk about the fabric, a little bit about the fabric. So. There's flaws in the fabric that you don't see with your eyes until you start painting. And when I mount the fabric, I mount it on, a, on the board, I tape it, I use blue tape, and I have to prepare the fabric. What I mean by that is it collects static because I live in a low humidity area. So if you wipe your hand across it, it charges it. It gives static to it. 
And if you don't wipe it clean, when you spray, the paint goes to the static area, to the positive charge area. So this is an example of a piece that was put on the board and you can see the streaks in it on the bottom, right? It was painted this way. I start from the bottom and paint towards the top. But as I was doing, it's like, oh dang, you can see right where I wipe my hand to smooth out the fabric. Even though it's taped on there, I still like oh, smooth it out. I forgot to wipe it down. So what I'm using to wipe it down is just a diaper, a cotton cloth damp, and that'll get that off. Um, another thing that we have problem with, um, Texlon fabric, especially the green is very, very staticky. And so any record player guys, the old record grinder days, does this look familiar? Yes, it does. Yeah. Disc washer, right? Yeah. So now these are like 70 bucks, right? No. For a zero stat gun, for an anti-static gun. So what it does is it puts out ions, positive ions, so it shocks you, right? Hold on to that and squeeze it, yeah. But it, it discharges the, the, um, the static in the fabric. So I have to do that mainly with Texlon fabric, not anybody else. So. Well, uh, wiping the fabric with a cloth glove. Well, yeah. The, doing the, the cloth does, but sometimes on the back side, there's still a charge on the back. And so I just wipe it with that. I can tell when I put it on the board, if it sticks to the board, if it's like clung, uh -huh. then I know, oh, it's got a positive charge to it. If I pull it and it just <laughs> sucks right back down, it's like, okay, just hit it with a zero stat and wipe it. That's good. Um, let's see, what else about fabrics? Nah, the rag works. Um, I've done hand prints, but not purposely that way. But yeah. And it does, I mean, oil from your fingerprints will show up on it also. Okay. All right. Um, more flaws. Tiny little specks that you don't see. I know that you can't see it from where you're at, but when you come up here to look at that, there's tiny little black specks that was in the fuchsia color. And then I painted it and it exaggerated it so it makes it stand out even more. So there's black flakes from something else. When I told you that it reactivates the paint below it, so this little hair from my little birds here was on the board. The board has got 20 years worth of paint on it, right? And so I'm painting, but I put too much in that little spot. It was too thick. So it soaks through the fabric, reactivates the paint behind it, and bonds to it. Take it off and you say, oops, I don't want that. Start over. So that's one of the problems if you put a thick coat on the first time. So when you put a first coat on, it's a light mist, kind of seals the fabric and then you're ready to go. So that's a, oops. Um, more static. Another, oops, you can just barely see it pulled up just a teeny bit of paint from behind, peeled it off. Uh, let's see, nothing special about that except, can you see in the middle? I forgot to wipe that, right? Right there. And there's probably a thumbprint or something, who knows. I forgot to wipe it. Well, you're going to have... So if I'm painting this piece here, and I'll have overspray over here and over here, and then I'm going to have another piece that's going this way. So I have paint here. You're not going to take the, back, the paint off from the, the backboard. So what you're saying is to put a paper behind it. I mean, it's going to have paint on it. You'd have to replace the paper every time. Right. You can just put paint on the Oh. Nah. Too much work. Okay. Yeah. Work, work, work. All right, um, another one, and you can see some runs. Oops, oops, too close, too much. Um, when I paint, I use light colors first, and then the dark colors. That's not so bad, this side looks worse. So this is painted this direction, and just, and I start with the red, and then I flip it over, 
paint the purple or the blue, but there was some static on it. So that blue that was coming out, the overspray, sticks to the red. Again, so that's just, and it's like, I know better, but oops. I know better than this. Texlon green, the worst. And it's like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It is so nice. And I'm thinking, I didn't touch there. Why did it have static there? Or why is my fingerprint there? I didn't touch that. Uh, here's a banner piece. Oops. Right there. Too much paint. And this is um, banner cloth, Bainbridge banner cloth. And you have to be careful with it because it does, it's not as sealed as well as our ripstop that we use, and so the paint goes through it a lot quicker. What did I do on here? Some flaw. Oh, same thing, some purple, some blue that fell on the red. This is uh, like a Cordura, so the paint sticks to that just fine. Flaws in it. This uh, green, it wasn't until I painted it that I saw a streak. And I don't know if you can barely see that. There's a little streak in that and it was after I painted it that I saw it, but you couldn't see it before. And it was right where um, I needed the image. Oh, no, so asking, yeah, do I have to use more paint for the Cordura? No, no. And, and it, it stiffens it. This is kind of stiff, where you know it's naturally soft. It's got a little crisp to it now. Now, this is coated on one side. This has um, the waterproofing on side, and it's still stuck to it. Uh, just another, oops. Um, trying some different, let's see, oopses. Nah, different techniques. Somewhere in there is an oops for something, but I don't see it right now. Oh, yeah, there's just a couple of little streaks. All right, so those are all my oopses. And now we'll kind of go on and talk about techniques. That's, make sure you have your fabric prepared. Yeah, one of them. Okay. Okay. So, on the back page of your handout, I have some do's and don'ts. Anyways, one of them, yeah, it's on the very back page. Um, you see, guys, who built model cars when you were little kids, right? Model, plastic model, right? And you shake the can for half an hour, right? Yeah. You don't need to. That's it. It's done. Okay. You don't have to turn it upside down to clear the nozzle. I've never cleared a nozzle for 20 years, yeah, it's just like, um, it's an ultra fine mist. It does build up on the tip and you just clean that. So if you have splattering going on, it may be that the nozzles, and you just take your fingernail and clean that. Another thing, if it's cold, then it does splatter also. And then another one is you're not putting enough pressure on the nozzle and it splatters, and you can do that on purpose. So cold is one thing that does, it's better to keep these warm then let them get too cold. So the garage gets down to 40 degrees. Blue is affected more than any of the other colors. I can see it because it's splotchy, like you say. And so I just put it in a, uh, a bucket that I have with warm water and set it in there to warm it up. Uh, let's see, what else is there on that? Okay, some techniques. Crinkle paint. That's probably the one that most people like. How this is done, and, and I'll do the demonstration out there, but basically you're crinkling first, and then you paint, okay? So we're gonna have our crinkle. The more you crinkle it, the smaller the, the crinkles are. And when we paint this, we're gonna paint it perpendicular. The can will be perpendicular because you want the mist to fall down or the paint to fall down and hit the peaks and not the valleys. So anything that's sticking out and up will catch the paint. Then we'll do a flip and a 180 to get the same peaks and valleys on the other side. But you don't have to paint both sides. So this one was painted on one side. Okay. The trick is just keeping your can kind of perpendicular, moving it, and we'll go some more. Now let's talk about painting it, yeah. So, uh, do's and don'ts. Do start off the fabric and stop off the fabric, meaning 
if this is my fabric, I'm going to start off, go all the way across, and release. Don't stop in the middle. Don't start in the middle. Um, you're not priming your 57 Chevy, so you don't circle paint. You know, you're not doing your old Chevy in gray primer. You want to keep a consistent, and you can arc, but a consistent flow uh, all the way through the fabric. You don't arc your arm this way. Because if you do this, it's light, heavy, and light coat. So you don't want to arc that. So you just want to just keep it consistent. The fades, you'll see how I do the fades. You can fade by pulling your arm back or by going up this way to create a fade just by, and then releasing the nozzle. Um, colors, this was fuchsia with blue, deep blue, to create the purple. And what do we have? We have like teal and yellows on there. Greens, this is painted both sides. Just, just a, probably, I don't know, blue on the green, red and blues. That's just random crinkling, it's not like you have some plan. Oh no, you, yeah, it's just like do it. You'll see the demonstration out there. This is do, taking it and doing this kind of effect, right, with gloves and then you paint it and then you can open it up and you get stuff like that. So if any of you have seen Bazzer's eyes on his revs, that's how he does it. That's, that's what we do. We just kind of, that's one of the ways. Um, blue and some kind of green. Go back to this. Okay, so you can crinkle it. You can, you can fan it. So you can just do this, crinkle, right? Yeah, just turn around, open it up, and the paint sticks to what was on the outside, right? Or you can purposely fold it and do folds kind of thing and open it up. Uh, I don't know what that is. So that was, that may have been a couple of times done that way. I'm not sure what that one was. Blue on blue. I like green, but one of the problems with green, again, is static stuff. But this is, I've got some runs in there. Just got too close. And is there a magic distance? No. Um, sometimes you want to be closer, but eight to 12 inches, somewhere in there. Um, works. You'll know if you're too close when it starts running. This is just blue on green. Blue on green. More blue on green. I think that's fuchsia with teal. Fuchsia. And that's only painted on one side. Uh, what do we got here? Just more green. Okay. So that's crinkle paint. We'll do a demonstration. Another one. Oh, another friend of mine that did stuff. Um, Randy Shannon, I don't know, he's an old timer, might ring a bell with some of you. So he does on uncoated nylon that he would wash and then he starts painting and he uses lots and lots of colors to get this to do his, his uh, pictographs uh, for him. So he gave me his sample and it's like, oh, that's good. I wanted to kind of simulate it with less work. So this is kind of with on mango color or yellowish mango color with red, maroon, and maybe a touch of black. I don't, yeah, there might be a touch of black in there. Trying to get the same effect because he had like 15 different colors that he was doing to get that. And it's like, I don't have that much time. Is that a resist technique? This is just a mask, just putting a mask. What we're going to show next is a resist technique, which is uh, soap. You can use soap, rubber cement, Elmer's glue, things that come off. Hot glue doesn't come off very well, but it will come off the nylon, but this is just not recommended. Soap is the easiest that I found. And what you can do with soap is pre-paint the fabric behind it. So this has some orange, which was a red color paint. Swirl the soap on it. It's just Dawn dishwashing soap. It comes, I just pour it into a little squeeze bottle with a, a micro tip and just squeeze it out. We'll do a demonstration of that in a minute. And then paint black on top of it and then hose it off. And the paint dries really quick. You can tell when the paint's dry when it's not shiny. So that's how fast it dries. I do use a heat gun in my, my painting area to speed it up even faster. But by the time I 
paint. I can walk into the house in a minute and it's dry and ready to sew. Still puts off vapors, still has smell, but it's, it dries very, very fast. So these are just soap techniques that you do by hand. This was just squirting it out of a squirter um, randomly. You can create purposeful designs. So I'll just, again, just. Can you take the uh, line of soap and then even take a paintbrush and make it? If you wanted to do that, you could do that. You could feather it. Okay. You could do that. So again, this one's painted with blue on the green fabric first and then do the soap and then put on the, the black paint. This is just right out of the, the Dawn soap, big blobs, right? Just squirting it on there. Um, and this little stuff up here, if you can see that, is just done with Sharpie, just black Sharpie to fill in the, the spaces. So this would work up in the sky real easy. You could see that. Some of this little stuff up in the sky, you're not going to see. It's just going to wash out. Oh, it'll fade. It'll fade eventually, but um, yeah, let's talk about that. See, I like this. I like this. You guys are asking the good questions. How long does Design Master hold up? Does it flake off? If properly applied, it does not flake off. How long does it last? It'll outlast the fabric. So this was blue feather. This was red with red paint, blue paint, one year outside on a tree, one year, okay? So the paint will outlast the fabric. This is neon green, right? A neon green with teal on it. And I think that was only a couple months. It wasn't very long. Um, oh, here we go. While we're talking about neon colors, two months from this to this, outside, two months. So I dated it. I folded it in half, stuck it on my fence this way. And two months later, I went out. This had faded in two months, and it was protected somewhat by the front, but that's what it started, and that's what it looks like. So neons do fade, but the paint stays there. All right. Let's see what else. Yeah. Um, rainbow colors, like there's 40 or some odd colors, so you can paint your own rainbow fabric or just buy it from Phil. But the thing with this is you can make more red, more orange, more yellow, as white as you want, and not be limited to a couple of inches. So, let's see. Uh, more, yes. Do you need to seal it? No, you yeah. don't. No, do you need to seal it? No. Do you need to iron it? No. Do you need to do anything to it? No. It's dried. Once it's dried, it's not toxic. No problems. When, you're, when you have a crinkle, though, I see some of it's still a little textured, and it's not going to like a new piece of material. It looks like it's crinkled, but it's still pretty flat. You can go sew it. You could sew it, not a problem. Not a problem. It looks like, oh, it's all wrinkled, and no, it's smooth as can be. Uh, more soap for the middle, donut holes, things like this. I haven't decided what I'm going to do with these panels, but I liked them, so I'll use them in a kite somehow. Did you make those little donut holes with your micro? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You just just um, using the micro tip, just draw circles. The the one thing about soap that I'll tell you is that it spreads. So if you think you're drawing a thin little line, it spreads out, right? So I'm like, wow, I, I want thinner lines. I want I don't like what it's doing. Put it in the fridge and let it get cold, and it thickens up, right? And then by the time you finish your painting then you have thin lines. So this is an example. You can get kind of kind of thin lines with it. So this is two different, this is a, like the little micro tip and this is a, another size here. So that kind of just shows you what you can do with soap. Do you paint while the soap while the dawn is wet? Or do you have to wait? No, no, it's, no, it's just a resist. It's a, and so you wait, as soon as you finish your drawing, you can paint, okay? You don't want to have the nozzle too close. You're going to move paint. Are you going to move soap? You don't want to do that. So it's kind of a mist. I haven't perfected yet the... Sometimes it creates a shadow around the, where the soap was. And I, I haven't figured it out every time because sometimes this is clean. It's got a sharp edge. 
And sometimes it doesn't. It's like the paint um, withdraws on the soap and causes the soap to, to shrink a little, and then there's a little mist around that spot. I haven't figured that out yet. I just haven't had time to experiment enough. This one, it was raining outside when I painted, so if you can see those tiny little specks, that's what the rain was doing when I was painting it. This is not painted vertically, it's painted horizontally. Okay. So we'll do, we'll do some of that where you can draw some pictures and then paint it. But it was raining and so that's a cool effect. And that's also a soap paint. Soap resist, yeah. When you have the soap, how long do you have before the soap, you apply the soap, um, and how long do you have before you can paint How long, so after I start till I paint? Yeah. Um, the longest I probably was like mm, maybe 10 minutes because I was doing a, a little more detail. So if you're doing a large um, piece, do it in sections? One of the problems with that is then you would have overspray. If I was spraying this, do you see? Yeah, so if I, so I want to do this all with soap, but I can't do it all at once. And if I just did soap here and I sprayed, then I'm going to have spray yeah. before underneath the soap, and I don't want that. So you gotta kind of plan ahead how much you wanna do. Um, yeah, lots of little detail, you can get little stuff, more just doodling, just doodling, playing around. Let's see, good enough with that. Any questions on soap, soap resist? In your also paint, you paint the soap With this applicator, you're gonna draw, yeah. and I'll do that demo in a minute. You're going to draw right on the fabric, squeezing this. The paint comes out. You doodle and then paint. Spray over it. Do you look at Dawn liquid soap? Dawn is all I've used. I'm sure any of them. Yeah. Yeah, I think any of those would probably work. Uh, let's see. What else we got? Masks. Oh, here we go. Um, it dries quickly. So it's like if you want to use this to brush on, it... The best way it dries so fast is you spray right into the lid. You can put your brush in there. By the time you get ready to paint, it's starting to dry. It's oh, I the, soap. the soap you could brush. Oh yeah. yeah. You know, I want to Jackson Pollock throw it, splash it, do it. But you got to paint all that too. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh. It works on almost all fabrics, all kite fabrics. There's a few that I found that it doesn't stick to if it's got too much, like a sil nylon that's got a coating that's slick. It doesn't stick very well. So what I do is I just get swatches from the manufacturers, and then I start, I, I take it apart, but I spray them to see if it works. Does this work? Does this color work? And so that's how I test them to see if they, if they work on the colors that I want to use. Um, let's see. Ah, we'll change the subject. I only use three colors, mainly, so while we're there. So this right here, I'll see if I can undo that. Perfect. This is all the colors of fabrics that I use and three colors of paint. So a fuchsia or a raspberry with blue turns it purple. Fuchsia with red makes it a, a hot red. Gray with teal, kind of changes it to a little bit of a, I don't know, aqua kind of, yeah, steel blue. You can put dark blue on it also there. Mango turns to orange, a brighter orange, um, or the red, sorry, red on mango. Red on yellow isn't as orange as you'd think it would be. It works better on, on a mango color, or they call this um, West Coast Gold is the other color, is the base color. Purple with blue, dark, blue on light blue, of course that. Green, so this is blue, teal on neon green, and this is just red on mango. We don't have teal, they didn't have it apparently, so we have aqua, which will be a close enough transition. And I use the teal or the aqua as a transition from the, the dark blue to the neon green, so just a little mist of that. So that's all the colors that I use. I have used a lot, but I like these. So this is my signature, is these colors. Okay, question? What are you doing, like, along the left hand, along that side? And you're doing two different colors to fade it. Well, now, this is applique. 
So this was one piece yeah. sewn onto the green. But, but on the green, you said you used dark blue and then the teal. On the green. How much, oh, how, like, how do I know where to go and where not to go? When to stop? No. No? No. Kind of like okay. when to stop, but how do you go from the dark blue, stop that, and start the teal, and then stop that for the green? And I'll demonstrate. We'll have that. So you're painting horizontally, aren't you? You're painting a piece. I'm painting, so this, this piece of green... Is, is this way on my board. First I paint teal, just a stripe, just right there. And then I paint the blue down here, and that's it. Oh, see, it's a good thing that you're asking. Lighter colors first. Right, lighter colors first. Um, painting techniques, I'll show this out there. A 50% overlap. Okay, so remember when I was saying don't do this, don't do this. Um, as you paint a stripe or whatever it is you're doing, you want the next one to overlap 50%. The next one overlap 50%, 50%. Otherwise, if you, otherwise you have gaps. How do you look to see? It's like, is it done well or not? I just hold it up to the light. I don't have a good example here. Um, and I'll hold it up to the light to see if it's a good transition, if it's good and smooth. Just, I can tell, oh, I got way too much paint here. I messed up. So I got to put some more back on there to even that out. Is this product only available in aerosol cans? Or can you it can be bought. It's very expensive by quartz and put into airbrushes. But do you want to pay 90 bucks for a quart or 100 bucks for a quart or whatever they charge? It was a lot. Um, and that was years ago that I heard. I've never done it. So uh, apparently there are some people that buy the, the paint and put it in airbrushes. It just doesn't work for my method, right? So I, I don't know. No, I don't. Could you just spray it directly into the cup of the airbrush cup and then, I don't know. I don't know if it would dry. It's too quick to get there. Yeah, it may. Yeah, I, I don't know, I don't airbrush. This works. Where are you sourcing your paint? Um, Michael's, Michael's Hobby Lobby with your 40% coupon. Otherwise, I go to a floral uh, wholesaler. Um, kitty litter. This is your basic kitty litter. Can't be painted vertically, though. So that's horizontal. You're going to put it on the ground like that. You're going to sprinkle kitty litter. You can't get too close or the kitty litter moves, right? Yeah. Which is an effect that could work if you wanted to. Multiple layers of kitty litter, or rocks, or gravel, or anything that you want to put down. Uh, a fade with kitty litter. Okay, just a fade, double sprayed. So I sprayed it once, sprinkle the kitty, move it around, spray it again, and then faded. Okay. A nightmare. Ooh, let's try everything. Ooh. Water, not a fan of it, but it's an option. This is water sprayed as it's running and then spray. Okay. So you've got a squirt bottle. Um, and I don't have, I'm not going to do this technique out there. Uh, it's just not worth the time to do that. But it's just a squirter. Squirt it as it runs, then you spray. Okay. So there's, but one of the problems with it is that it takes the, the paint with it as the water's running and sticks and doesn't stick. So it's kind of... You got to play with that. No, no. Yeah. Now the kitty litter is cool because you just you know it's on the it's in the garage on the floor and you just cardboard on it, sprinkle it around, paint it, and then shuffle it around again and paint it again. Again, I, I've I've made maybe two kites with this. I just don't use it. Um, let's see. We'll get to that one later. Elmer's glue. But soap's better, so that was Elmer's glue. I like that. Okay, anything that you find that you could, that, that'll stay on there. So leaves blow away, so you got to tack them down. So you can use spray mount. The problem with spray mount is then you got to remove it. 
Um, so I tape the leaves down. I just put a little piece of, of painter's tape on the back and press them down to hold it while I spray. Again, this has to be done horizontally. Oh, uh, red and blue crinkle. Um, masks or um, this is from Home Depot. It's something that inserts into your doors. It's a grill kind of grill, right? So Ron Gibbing uses those to get his patterns. And so this was just one that I picked up and it's like, just lay it. Yeah, well, uh, this one I painted red first, put the grill down and then painted black over it. So this was just a little piece that I was, same thing. One of the problems when you're spraying with masks, and we'll try to remind me to get there, is the pressure lifts the masks up. So you gotta make sure they're down. Oh, here's a clean water. That's not too bad. That one turned out all right. Doilies. Put a doily down. Okay. And from the back side, it's still just as good. Um, might have been Elmer's. Not sure. Uh, this is just using a piece of cardboard and just fanning it down. And then an oops. We'll do that. Dots or... Yes. Yeah, we'll demonstrate. I'll, I'll demonstrate it. No, it's not mask. You're just holding the cardboard and just paint and then move the cardboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, donut or reinforcers. whole reinforcers. I don't know, little dots of some sort. Too much work. Taking those things off, sticking them on there, painting. It's like ah, that's too much work. Tape. Tape works well. This was a sample uh, for a kite that I did make, and so I just got tape. And the nice thing about tape, you can get it in different thicknesses. You can cut it with an um, exacto knife or scissors before you put it on to create shapes. So this was just red on fuchsia. Uh, water, and just sprinkle it. I mean, just uh, mist it. It's a little mist on water. And then you can dry it right off. You take a paper towel. As soon as you see the paint's not wet, you can just put a paper towel on there. Absorbs the water and it's done. Okay. Uh, rubber cement from the brush, right out of the brush. Put the rubber cement, and then you got to rub it off, right? Uh, some found items, okay. just st stuff, right? Anything like that. Rocks, whatever you want to do. Uh, water fade. This one, it didn't stay white underneath, so that one didn't work as well. Oh. Hard to see, but anyways, you might get, this is black on blue, and I think in the right situation, this would work. You know, it's just I gotta find the right combination. So I don't know if you can see that, but I think in the right place. But otherwise, it's just like, yeah, that looks bad. I think this was water done. Yeah, just another water. More water, more water, more. Rubber cement, two, two times water. Just wet, try it, wet. More tape, different thicknesses. Template, um, or stencil, I mean. A stencil that I cut this out on poster board, sprayed it, and then because it was a banner, a flag, I had to have both sides the same, so I had to registrate, get registration perfect on it. But unfortunately, when I did that, I got a little mist underneath because of the pressure of the can and the direction I was painting. It's like, psh, so that was a no-go. Let's see, what else we got? Ah, we'll do this too. How do I seal the edge? How do I keep that mask down? So if I'm doing it horizontally, uh, spray mount, you can spray mount things. I don't like spray mount because it does, you put too much on usually. And then it leaves residue behind a lot of times. And then you have to clean the residue off. And if you're making a kite and you got spray mount and you sew it, then you got this little seam of spray mount and then you get dirt and dust in there and you can see all that. So I'm really not a fan of, of spray mount, but sometimes you have to. Okay. So horizontally, not so much. Vertically, if I stick this, this was probably done vertically. And so I had it on the, on the board. 
painted one side, it worked. Oh, good, let's go to the other side. Got my registration just right, and phew, this, the spray mount didn't stick at that spot. Yes, Kat? How many times do you think you that I've probably had three or four coats. Yeah. So one of the problems with, like I said, you put a light mist on to kind of seal the fabric, and then you can kind of go to it. I put three or four coats on, and you'll see that, how I do that. The more you put on it, it doesn't change once, you, once it's the color you want saturated. I mean, you can just spray away, and it's not going to change it. Um, hmm. I think we're through that. All right, masks. Oh, your feathers, your little feathers that you have. Linda was asking, how'd you do that? So I made a, a board. So first you have your feather that is cut out, painted, insert, paint both sides, make sure the registration is perfect. So that's why I have this hard board here. And so then it's just a coat of black, 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 to get your stripes. And then Linda signs them all, or writes on them all. Um, poster board, if you want to take the time, this is just done with an X-Acto knife. Some of you, Gary, can just print it out on his printer, computer, giants, and print out stencils, right? So I'm the old-fashioned way. Yeah. So this one was done, various things. This is just a sample of all. And it looked better on the, on the drawing. It's like, oh, that's going to be a cool-looking kite. And then when I put it together, it's like, oh, that's not so cool. So this right up here, this was the stencil for that piece upside down somehow. There, there, moved it over. This is soap, soap, crinkle. This is just um, poster board, crinkle, and more soap over here. Let's see, what do we want to do next? Yeah, I, it looked good on paper, but the real kite's like, nah, not so much. Oh, here we go. Um, hot glue. So you can do doodle with hot glue, put it on there. One of the problems with it, it's not perfectly flat on the bottom always, and so it has little waves in it, so you're going to get a little mist underneath. Um, this was on nylon. I did it on nylon. No, not this one. This was on glass. How did I get this, make that just on glass, and then a razor knife to get it off? Um, this, you would just hold it up to the fabric, psh, psh, spray it. If you were going to put this on, then you'd have to tack it on there. A little spray mount. Um, just little spirit man. You can do that. Groot, yes. Groot. No, because that's just not my technique. I mean, you can do whatever, you know, rainbows you can do. But I, I pre draw where I need the paint to be. So I don't waste paint. You know, so like on this, I had a piece of orange or mango that was about this size. I drew a line on the mango that says this is where I've got to start instead of starting here or here. And I just draw that line and that tells me that's my reference point to where to put the paint and where to stop. And I just make sure when I, I assemble my pieces, I use just uh, 3M scotch tape to hold it and I, oh, yeah, anyways, we'll get there. Make sure that you don't put tape on painted areas because it pulls the top layer off just a little bit. So you'll be able to see if you put scotch tape on there and you press it down and you peel it off, you'll be able to see where that scotch tape was laid. That's the one weakness in this. I, I draw a pencil line. No, because you're cutting that away. That pencil line. So here, imagine this is a piece of mango all the way across right here, right? And I drew a line right here that says, that's where I want to start my paint. And then I painted it, put it on, sew it, and then I cut all that off so that pencil line goes away once you cut that mango off, right? This kind of applique technique. Um, painter's tape to mount it on the uh, paint board. Let's see. Oh, Cat brought a bunch of these. 
Again, you'd have to mount those tape or spray mount. If you want a hard edge, it's got to be right next to it. A hard edge means a crisp, crisp line. This is a hard edge. If you want a soft edge, then you pull things away. So this is a soft edge. And okay, those are soft edges somewhat. So a cloud kind of effect. This is, this is done with um, poster board, just ripping it, random. And then we're going to paint. I'll show you how this is done. And you just hold this against the fabric, pssst, spray it, move, pssst, spray it, move, pssst, spray it, move. And so you can create some cool stuff with that. Um, you can do textures like these, same thing, scales for fish, lizard scales, whatever. Again, more things. So I do have some poster board. Um, I don't use it very often for, for that, but I brought some. I think this is my favorite technique, though, is just doing that. Uh, anything else? Well, you can put the corrugated right next to it right. and get it, yeah. Is that, is that going to give you a softer edge or just a If it's touching edge? the fabric, it'll be a, a, a sharp, okay. yeah, if it's touching so the fabric. it doesn't fabric. matter about the paper. Thickness? Paper. No, because you're going to have, yeah, a flat piece again, so, so that doesn't. Blue, uh, tape, that's painter's tape, tape, yeah. That sticks well enough to give you a sharp edge. Um, yeah. So these, this was, this was masking tape, electrical tape, something else. Some other kind of tape. I think I have three different sizes there. And I did a couple of kites with this pattern on it, with tape, uh, long, long ago. All right, questions. We've got to have some more questions. No? Okay. Oh, yeah, you could do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Here's the, here's the hard way to do tails. Because these are little sleds, um, it has to be girly fabric. What's girly fabric? Anything less than an ounce and a half. If it's not an ounce and a half, it's girly fabric. Okay. So this is girly fabric, and the tail. If I was to app, or if I was to sew right. black and white stripes, way too heavy. So I had to paint the stripes. So I have a um, a board. Oh yeah, and you can yeah. As thin as you can you know, paint on it. Um, because when you start applique, if you're down a little to it, uh, you know, making your stripes anything less than two inches, mm -hmm. paint in the left. Okay. Yeah. So I have something similar to this that just has stripes cut out in it. And I put this inside the board and paint it. So that's just painted on. Ken Conrad is now going to print these for me. Dye sublimation, so he'll print those for me. And he's going to print, I just paint one side on these, because you can't get the registration perfect. Because when you flip it over, you're going to be off somewhere, you're going to be off just a little bit, and you're going to have a fuzzy edge. And so hopefully Ken's going to be printing kites for me, not this pattern, but just to save time. All right. I think we're going to get ready to go outside in a minute. All right, so... Soap. We'll get stuff ready. I think I'll just paint it out there. I think I'll just put the soap on out there. So here I'm not worried about static or anything. This is just demonstration. So if you have oopses, that's okay. What we'll do is I'll go outside. I'm going to take some of my scrap fabric, and I'll do the demonstration. I'm not going to wear the mask so that you can hear me. Um, you probably don't need to have a mask because it's breezy and you're going to be far enough away. We're not in a self-contained um, spot. What else do we want to take? Some of this. Heat gun. We'll take the heat gun. Templates. Nah. That was just another. A butterfly stencil. Paper cutter. It's like, oh, I could do little butterflies. What else do we want? We'll take that one. Groot. Yeah, let's see. I don't think I'll need that. Black paint, we'll just I'll carry that out. 
Got those. And fabric swatches, fabric stuff. Any questions on this in here? Any questions? All right, let's go see how it happens, see the magic.